On behalf of the Biochemical Society and Portland Press, I'm delighted to welcome you today to today's webinar, which is part of our Biochemical Focus webinar series. Topics in the series include different areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via text, and we welcome suggestions for future topics and speakers to feature in our webinar series. Please see the website for more details. So hello everyone, my name is Professor Helen Whedon and it's my great pleasure to chair, to chair today's webinar. I'm really glad you could join us today. Today's webinar title is Single Cell RNA Sequencing Challenges and Opportunities. As you are aware, single cell RNA sequencing has been gaining popularity and has been applied to characterize cell types and to understand disease and developmental processes. At this webinar, we will welcome two speakers, Dr. Thomas Otto and Ms. Alexandrina Pancheva from the University of Glasgow, who will introduce the most popular microfluidic approaches, Chromium 10X, and outline the main steps of standard single cell RNA sequencing analysis. They will also give examples of applying single cell RNA seq to biological problems and discuss the opportunities of, initi of initiatives like the Human Cell Atlas. Finally, they will outline some open problems in the field. They will discuss the limitations of current methods for detecting cell-to-cell -cell interactions and present some recent advances of studying interactions through sequencing physically interacting cells and the development of computational approaches. Before I hand over to our first speaker, I'd like to mention that questions will be asked at the end of the webinar, but please do send in your questions during the talk. If you have a question, please type in the question box in the image on the screen, stating who your question is for, and we will try to answer as many as possible at the end. Our first invited speaker to date is Dr. Thomas Otto. Thomas is a senior lecturer at the University of Glasgow. His research mostly focuses on methods around single cell transcriptome sequencing. He has, been in, he has been involved in establishing the Chromium 10X technology and analysis for several projects, include, including exploring remission in rheumatoid arthritis, studying malaria and heart diseases. He has been fundamental in setting up a single cell RNA sequencing users group, including a single cell atlas at Glasgow and a monthly single cell seminar series. He is also an honorary lecturer at the University of Ghana. I will now hand over to Thomas to give the first part of the webinar. Thanks, Ellen, for this nice introduction and welcome everyone to our seminar um, webinar, it is not seminar, about single cell opportunities and challenges. And today I'm going to speak about 10x genomics and uh, how we apply that in, uh, to understand remission in rheumatoid arthritis. So, hope you can hear me well. Why, why do we want single cell? I mean, Helen already alluded to some ideas, but well, if you know, if you think about blood, before you always had not just the different, if you think about omics methods, to capture, you have all everything together. So the different cell types in the blood here in the PBMCs, this all mixed together. But even if you would cell sort and then we capture, you would never have the different stadium of potential development of the different cells. Other approaches, I'm very much feeling at home, is parasite life cycles. So basically, how does the parasite propagate to its life cycle? And their single cell, be able to capture specific time points is really crucial. And that allows us to do really cool things like host parasite interaction, which is actually a field I'm, I'm uh, doing my research at the moment. But obviously, there's also tissue. So, how you can do in this case small intestinal mucose with the different epithelial cells, goblet cell, etc. And here, obviously, a lot of people will think about single cell sequencing, which we do, but think about single cell um, imaging methods to capture spatial arrangement of cells, something that's really coming very hard, is going to come in the next years. Or if you're interested in cell propagation, how basically T cells develop, you can take and capture them through the body and to understand. Or you could see a T cell repertoire sequencing to see how this change and evolve. So there's a lot of application and a lot of 
uh, possibilities to think how to to apply that and just to kind of think about it before when you did normal RNA sequencing the aim is to basically take a sample and you want to capture how often the abundance of transcripts and this is done so sequencing the mRNA and then counting how many reads map and with that you can actually get the average expression of a cell so each of this is basically one expression of a specific gene you know nothing about the cellular heterogeneity with single cell, on contrary, you can actually split the different cell types here. You can sequence, in theory, everyone alone. You can say the expression of the different genes. And with that, as Helen said, you have different cell types and you have this heterogeneity where you can look into the samples. So that is actually our goal. And this is what is actually possible. There are different methods to do single cell. And uh, first, it was plate-based method like SmartSeq2. Where, um, where for every cell you have to do library, but recently um, drop seek flow methods were are more common. Where basically you, you split the cells in in little uh, basic beads and can then sequence them. And this allows you far more throughput, up to ten thousand cells, and you can capture that. Interestingly, what you also do, and where actually the the price advantages comes in, every transcript can actually gets a kind of a postcode of from which cell it comes from and which transcript it is, and then you can put everything together and sequence it. So how does it look? And again, this is 10x. There are other methods you could look. There's new, two new methods now where people approached us. So down the line, things will get actually with more opportunities to look at. So here you have the 10x ship where you put your samples in, and then what happens in inside, you have basically here your, your cells, and you want to pair them up with the gel beads. This is water, and then the water droplets in oil come together. So this looks like like this so here you have the, the different uh, water droplets and he will see a cell coming in so now there is you see how the cell is basically now with, with, with the gem or the gel bead and this is gel bead what you have you have basically uh, you did the partition into the droplets and in each of the droplets you have your gel bead you have your cell and some enzymes and on this bead basically what you have you have barcodes you have um, adapters which have actually a poly T tail, so the poly A tail of the transcript of the cell once it's sliced can adapt. Then you have a sequencing adapter, a barcode, that's basically it tells you from which cell it is, so you can see it's green, and here you will have a pink and an orange one. And then you have in UMI, it's more technical, but basically with MUI, you really know from which transcript your um, the reads is coming from. And when you do that, actually, the nice thing is that every transcript gets barcoded and gets uh, basically labeled. Every the problem is this is a statistical project, pro, um, and I don't have time to really dive too much into into the the nitty gritty. But normally you capture 20% of the transcripts from a cell, and the other 80% you lose, which is so called uh, a drop out. So you you have to be always be aware of that. There's all the other issues. What happens when two cells go together with a bead is so called doublets. So the process itself is is um, it's challenging but it's working and importantly you need viable cells if not they basically dissolve and basically they 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 pollute your your reads here so once this this is done um basically the the cell um is as attached what you have you have uh, so called constructs where here you have your your, your reads of interest uh, sorry your transcript of interest and this gets sequenced with one read and the other reads basically also so, so called the, the 10x barcode or the um the, the the basically which from which cell it comes from and bioinformatically afterwards you can map the reads back to the genome and you know exactly from which cell this transcript is expressed the good thing is as you tag each transcript you can actually pull them together here and sequence them here we go and then you do luminous sequencing and here we are um one of the downs well, I have to say a big issue here, obviously, it's, it's a price. So one one run for up to 10,000 cells is around one half thousand pounds, and the sequencing can cost one to three thousand pounds. So a big, big downside here is actually the price for this, but you can get a lot out. So in summary, we this is a three prime method, a flow based method 10x, where basically because you just sequence close one really close to the three prime end, there's five prime methods now. The efficiency is 20 to 60 percent depending on your load. So if you put load, you try to load 10,000 cells, depending on library prep viability, you get out between 2,000 to 6,000. As I said, you have dropouts, you just capture 20 percent of the transcripts. 
very important is something that you really have to have a very good working setup it really works best with a lot of viable cells we have to uh, get rid of dead bloods uh, dead cells and um, obviously you have to be careful when you clean your samples the more often you have your samples laying around the more likely the cells are to die you can load up to 10,000 cells easily and sequence. If you sequence more, you have more doublets. And this can be tricky to basically pull apart. And as I said before, it might be uh, a bit expensive for, for some labs. So you really have to think about a good project where you want to apply that. And down on the, the bioinformatics, it is really not a lot, a lot of time to talk about that in more, more details. But what you what it's nice, it's a lot of established processes where you basically do a quality control, you reduce, you, you re so here, for example, you look for viable cells, get rid of cells that have just mitochondria, so dead cells, get rid of doublets. You have to select the dimensions, so you have to see what is the room of, of, of components that have information. And then what you can see, you can do integration of sample, and you can basically uh, you can project it in a so-called UMAP that you probably all know. And what is a UMAP? It's basically um, a projection of an n-dimensional space into two dimensions. Here, what you see nicely, every dot represents one of your cells. And here you have the B cells, here you have the, the T cell complex and a monocyte complex. And um, every cell is basically clustered to each other, depend how similar they are. And I mean, in the end of the day, this is fantastic because this is PBMC. This is all from this uh, throughout tutorial, and you can really now to, to think about application to use that. Obviously, some people will think, well, you know, A, it's expensive, and B, it's bioinformatics. How feasible it is? I, I personally, obviously, I'm slightly biased here because I do a lot of bioinformatics. But I think we have a lot of courses, like the, if, you, if you're interested, for example, we have the bioinformatics, the Glasgow Bioinformatics Summer School. If you Google that, you would find it. We teach people in a week the basics of this analysis, and people are able to do this, uh, this, this, um, this technique. It's not like they're experts, but they have enough to start and doing their own things. And there's a lot of other courses and resources, and, and the nice thing, it's all for free. So it really, there shouldn't be an issue. And, there's a lot of help out, and probably if you're interested in your institute, there will be a bioinformatician that can help you. So with this in mind, uh, we thought to maybe show you uh, an example where we applied. This is one of the first uh, projects actually I did when I arrived at Glasgow around four years ago. So Mariola, who's an immunologist, uh, she uh, is interested in rheumatoid arthritis and in remission. So rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune disease, attacks the body. And it's if you treat people, some people stay in, in uh, uh, okay or Quebec in remission so and other people flare up again and she has a hint that it might be to do with macrophages and with Stefano from Rome she got um, biopsies and we decided actually to sequence these and we had two cohorts one cohort with with different phenotypes uh, the doublets and we did the whole joints and then uh, another one where we just focused and cell sorted the macrophages. We're saying that most of the analysis was actually done by, by Lucy, uh, who's a PhD student in the lab of Mariana and myself, and versus I tried to fund it, and she did all the analysis. She, she's an immunologist, did bioinformatics master, and then a, a mixed bioinformatics slash wet lab a immunology a PhD, and she, at the moment she's writing up, so all credit to her for the coming slides. So, the first thing we basically did, we sequenced this and we isolate all the macrophages and generate a UMAP. So what you're going to see is, is basically the different macrophages. Every dot represents a specific macrophage and they are clustered based on similarity. So overall, I think there were 25,000 cells and we kind of then decided to cluster them in nine clusters. But how you do that? Well, this is more like a random, not a random process, but you have to think how, how, how close how, how much uh, resolution can you have? And what you, we normally do, we call marker genes. That means for each of this cluster, we look for genes that are uniquely expressed in this cluster. And then what we do, we use a so-called heat map where every column is, 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 represents a cell and every row is, is the expression of the specific gene, marker gene, um, in, in, uh, in these different cells. And you can see that for this cluster here, for example, we have a APOE, for example, we have clear marker genes a little bit expressed in this other uh, blue one. We have some well-defined clusters. And here, for example, the SPB1 cluster here in red is also quite well-defined. So we can assign specific uh, markers to clusters that can check how well it's expressed. And that's led us to us to kind of have a general different levels of, of MAC positive and MAC negative. Uh, fibroblasts, uh, macrophages, sorry, 
and then some of the are XM positive, and others have um, like SPP1 positive, so, and, and uh, so far so good. But what do we learn out of that? Well, I got interested because we have different five different phenotypes. So when we looked at the distribution of our different clusters, we have the blue, which I call a bit naive, I'm not immunologist, the, the good macrophages. Um, they're basically more often occurring in healthy and, and UPA is early arthritis. And you have more the, the red macrophages with more SPP1 inflammation. And the, you can see that the, the, and what you see is the abundance of, of the different population relative to each other. And you can see that they differ between the different patients. What was also nice, we went then to um, a, a P cohort, which is an IMED bio uh, clinical cohort. And we looked there about inflammation association with SPP1 and synovium, and we could find a correlation. For some people say it's not a huge correlation, but in clinical studies, it's actually quite nice. So we're quite happy that there's a kind of that our our classification of, of macrophages kind of is, is correlated to specific phenotypes, or uh, basically people and, and how and their disease. But we didn't really understand the function and what do we see where in the process. So Mayer's idea was actually here to um, use primary fibroblasts. Um, synovial and basically put different macrophages to them. So she cell sort, and you can see here we have the blue uh, macrophages and a bit different uh, fibroblasts. And the fibroblasts are important for inflammation. Uh, and what we could see is, and yeah, maybe you should add that that the, the, then well, how we access that. So we didn't do 10x. We used the BD Rhapsody system. So it's also a single cell method, but rather using the whole transcriptome. We have a targeted approach, it's just PCRs out of 400 to 450 genes of interest. And what we could see actually is here that if you put in a fibroblast with MAC negative macrophages, you have actually more inflammation. Well, so if you have put uh, that together with MAC positive, you can actually see that this inflammation cluster, the red one, the bad one, is going away. So our conclusion was actually that MAC, uh, MAC DK negative CD4. 204 negative cells actually uh, induce inflammation, where else MAC positive, so the blue one, uh, CD4, uh, CD206 positive macrophages actually uh, more re induce repair response, which is actually a nice finding. If you want to know more about this, um, I'm, I'm invite you to kind of look at our paper. In the summary, actually, we have this the thought that we have a, the question is, for inflammation or to, for someone to just keep healthy or to stay in remission, it's a ratio of specific macrophages. But if this ratio turns, so you have more negative, uh, MAC negative uh, macrophages, and the ratio is around 2.5, you have more inflammation, and with that, you have problems with your joint. So, um, obviously, for, for, for me personally, this was an important study. We shouldn't take any credit in, in the rheumatoid arthritis, immunology. It's mostly how the single cell could be applied, how we could do different things. It actually helped us with a lot of frameworks for industry collaborations because they couldn't see that actually while it's working. Because what you can do now, if you think about the different the different um, the core cultures, you can actually target this core culture. You could see, oh, you know, I think, well, why don't we use this? Um, this drug to see if this changes something, the phenotype, and you can basically do tests, sequence, and can actually then do a kind of advanced drug screen or component screen to understand how actually the cell-cell interaction will change due, um, due to uh, the different drugs. As Helen mentioned, we, we have a, a little cell atlas. It's not as huge as a human cell atlas, but it's all the studies basically people want to want to publish or have published can be accessed here, so you can basically go on this link and you see here our rheumatoid arthritis. At the moment, it's a bit slow. We need a bit more of, of, of changing our, our ways to kind of present the data. But the nice thing is here, for example, we have this gamma delta T cell knockout data set, and you can actually look at this UMAP. You can change the resolution. You can change how the clusters are changing. And then between these different clusters, so you can change actually the clustering. You can then have a look how specific interesting markers of interest are actually expressed throughout a knockout and a wild type. And the idea is to, to give access to a lot of peop to people to look at the data. And this is actually something really nice in single cell. I personally worked a lot with de novo assembly and mapping and, and technical things. It's always difficult to visualize things. But in single cell, somehow, because we have, we, the, the unit is a single cell, we are actually able to really nicely show um, be able to to look at the different uh, um, 
and the different cells and, and visualize this. I'm realizing I'm a sl slightly out of time, so I'm going to try to to wrap it up. We we really have, and the nice thing is that single cell is not something as static. We really have new methods coming out, like surface proteome. You can do attack seeks, open chromatin, um, uh, um, um, general epigen uh, epigenetics. As I said, very huge is going to be the the spatial transcriptomics. That is really something to come. There are things about CRISPR, B cell, T cells. Something that Alex is going to talk in a minute is about cell cell interaction and about pseudo time, how things change over time. So, um, in conclusion, I think I hope to, to give you a taste that single cell is extremely useful. You have to, you can really answer a lot of interesting questions, but you have to be a bit careful about the, the setup that you have viable cells and think a bit about cost. And then you can do very interesting the cell cell interaction. Before I get back to Helen and then to Alex, I just wanted to thank my lab and you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for such an interesting and informative presentation. So our second invited speaker is Alex Pancheva. Alex is a final year PhD student at the University of Glasgow with a background in computing science. Her research focuses on developing computational methods for single cell RNA sequencing data. And specifically, she's focusing on understanding cell-to-cell -cell interactions and temporal processes. So I will now hand over to Alex to give the second part of the webinar. Um, thank you, Helen, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Alex. I'm a PhD student at the University of Glasgow. and. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to focus on cell-to-cell uh, -cell interactions in single-cell RNA-seq. So as Thomas already said, single-cell RNA-seq is great. And I'm not saying this because I'm biased. Uh, there's so much that you can do from understanding heterogeneity to ordering pure cells along a process, be it developmental one or a disease progression. You can think about cell fate. Um, and once you've kind of ordered your cells along a process, you can identify genes that are changing along those processes. Um, and of course, with the emerging omics single cell technologies, you can think about integrating multiple modalities. Uh, but today we're just going to focus on cell to cell interactions. So why cell to cell interactions? Um, Interactions are fundamental to development and homeostasis. However, sometimes when we have uh, malfunctioning cells, they can induce changes to their neighboring cells and the uh, um, surrounding microenvironment. So when we think about that, um, understanding what goes wrong can potentially help us identify therapeutic targets um, for different diseases. And the focus um, in the beginning, when the whole idea of cell-to-cell -cell interactions um, analysis through single cell was emerging was, well, we have those databases available and those databases contain curated resources of ligands and receptors. And then we have our single cell RNA-seq data. And then on top of that, what we've got is um, different scoring functions that we can consider. So um, a recent paper by Dimitrov et al, um, that currently available in BioArchive actually looks at those different methods for identifying cell-to-cell -cell interactions. And the question they're asking is, are the top trunk interactions actually comparable between all those methods? And essentially what they find is that you can take a real single cell RNA-seq data set, apply those different methods, and what you get actually is not necessarily overlapping interactions. And the reason for this is not only because the data, some databases are much richer than others, but also the scoring functions. So there are quite a few variabilities in what we can see. And one thing that I'm kind of going to um, discuss later is that potentially what we need is that actually a good ground truth setup of comparing emerging methods for single cell inter um, for cell to cell interactions. As um, Thomas was saying, single cell is a very dynamic field. Uh, back in um, up to date, there are, for example, over 80 methods for detecting pseudotype. And the community really does need support in terms of understanding when to use what. But forgetting for a moment the idea of databases, yes, they are useful. However, 
if you're wanting to do something that's not human or mouse data, you're basically, you don't really have access to those databases. So what if we actually have access to um, physically interacting cells. So instead of focusing on what we already know, we have the potential to uncover new interactions. We may be, be able to see, okay, so those genes are not really annotated, but they are showing up as potentially interacting ones. Um, so we can basically learn more biology and present a new way of unbiased analysis of single cell RNA-seq interaction data sets. And what was really great in the beginning of um, last year, a paper was published in Nature that looks at physically interacting cell sequencing, or for a short, PIC-seq. And the idea here is that you begin by tissue dissociation, and then you stay in your cells for um, markers. They need to be mutually exclusive, which obviously has its limitations, but then you sort and sequence your single positive and double positive populations. And essentially those double positive populations are your interacting cells um, or PICs for short. On the computational side of things, this approach relies on prior clustering, um, and then they need to generate synthetic reference profile. So we are going to present an alternative that basically streamlines the process um, of analyzing such interacting uh, population, and then we are also able to um, identify more genes related to interaction. So um, I'm not going to go into the details of this idea because we'll be here for another hour. Um, so I'm just going to give you a taste and then uh, feel free to drop me a line afterwards and more than happy to discuss if you are um, keen on computational analysis. So generally in single cell, after we've done the alignment and all those really annoying tasks, we get to the state of a cell by gene matrix. And this can be very high dimensional because with something like 10 x chromium, you can get many, many cells and um, um, you get expression for um, all the different genes. Of course, this cell by gene matrix can be quite sparse because of the nature of single cell. And then what we say is, well, instead of dealing with something that's so high dimensional, what we can do actually is um, identify groups of genes. And those groups of genes can be things that co-vary, which means that we basically get things that are co-varying together in the different cells. And we are going to call those groups of genes topics. Um, and each cell essentially, the way we're able to model each cell is a contribution of those different groups of genes. So for one cell, we can have um, a group of genes or topic that's very specific to the cell subtype, for example, T cells. Or sometimes we can have something that's quite general because it's made up of housekeeping genes, for example. So essentially what we're doing here is we are identifying groups of genes that co-vary together and each cell we are mo modeling as a contribution of the, those different groups of topics. And um, that's the first step of our approach. We do this um, step on a non-interacting cell matrix. So that can be sorted cells or for example, cells before interaction has occurred. So now that we, um, so now that we've kind of established a profile for a reference cell, let's think about what exactly is an interacting cell. So the, interacting cell will share some of the profile features of a reference cell, but then we also on top of that have groups of genes that are changing due to this physical cell to cell interaction. And that's what exactly we are doing in our second step. We are fitting a similar model to our interacting population, but for some of the genes, we know what kind of groups they belong to. And what's left to do is capture the rest of the genes that are involved in interaction. Following this procedure, then we can offer a way of ranking genes based on whether they're involved in interaction. And this is the basis of our model. We've uh, validated it on synthetic experiments. Um, the paper is currently in submission, but what would be more interesting to discuss here is actually um, its actual application to biological data sets. So our first application is to the uh, before mentioned PIC-seq data set. So this PIC-seq data set consists of T cells and dendritic cells. We have as a reference some 
T cells that are grown in their own co-culture and some dendritic cells again in their own co-culture. They are taken across uh, several different time points. So we have cells captured for three hours, 20 hours and 48 hours. And on top of that, we also have those physically interacting T cells and dendritic cells. So they are positive for the two markers for the T cells and the dendritic cells one. So this is the output of our first step, as I've shown you earlier. This is basically when we are kind of grouping covariant genes together. And then if we actually look at the expression of that across our T cells and dendritic cells, what we can see is um, here, for example, topic 12 um, seem, or is, uh, is capturing groups of genes that are expressed in the dendritic cells, while topic 23 is capturing um, genes expressed in the uh, T cells. And then we have some uh, topics just captured, just expressed in a subset of those. And what we found was actually that they're capturing temporal information depending on the time point of the data. And of course, we have things that are not really that expressed, meaning that they're consisting of housekeeping genes or perhaps mitochondrial genes. When we zoom in on some of the topics, exactly what we can see here is that those are genes that are covariant, and actually in that case, they're all pretty high in the dendritic cells as opposed to the T cells. So we performed the second step of our analysis, and what we arrive with is basically a list of genes, potential candidates for interaction. And um, what we've noted in our analysis was that, yes, we are finding the genes um, that the original publication found, but in addition to that, we have some further candidates of interaction that can be potentially analyzed and validated. Um, what we also note is that we find genes related to immune response and cell, cell adhesion. And generally what we have with cell adhesion is that, um, that those are generally genes related to interaction um, and be it like physical interaction. Some of the genes that um, we are capturing in the same groups of genes in our second step are actually genes that are beginning to not be expressed at the first time point, but over time um, their expression changes. So next we went to apply our methods to a bone marrow data set. So this bone marrow data set, again, we had a reference population that was the sorted cells of the bone marrow, but we also had interacting population and those were uh, dissociated doublets. Um, again, similar steps as outlined before. However, here it's also important to note, that once again, we're seeing adhesion molecules, which means that indeed the, those are physically interacting cells. So, so far we've talked about capturing interactions with modification of standard single cell, or by when I say standard, I mean standard droplet method, because those are generally the methods that are generally used because you're capturing uh, more cells for your money type of thing. Um, however, we've decided to try our approach on uh, 10x chromium, which is the often the standard. So um, the original publication was looking at COVID patients and the authors noted, well, in this cluster here, we see a lot of doublets. So what we decided to do was, can we train our model on the singlets? And perhaps some of the doublets are not really technical noise, but actually interacting ones. And yes, some of the genes that we identify to be changing are cytokines and chemokines. However, here it's important to note that we don't really have um, 100% confidence in our reference population. So generally when it comes to interactions, yes, there might be some potential, but we would say and recommend using our approach to pick sick like data set that have been designed to specifically capture interactions. Um, so far, we've managed to propose a new method that does not require as much prior information, be it curated resources of ligands and receptors, prior clustering, generation of synthetic reference profiles. This is the first um, application of a topic model for to detect genes as a result of interaction. So the computational side of things is quite interesting. And then in addition to matching the state of the art, we are also able to um, identify further candidates for interaction. However, our work here is not done and um, there is a lot of open problems for keen people who are wanting to join the world of single cell. Um, as Thomas was saying, it's a never evolving field. So um, back to my ligand and receptor studies, we need to consider a good benchmarking data set 
standard for evaluating novel methods to make sure that they are actually applicable to biology because we don't really want to be spinning a biology story from different angles. When it comes to protocol development, there is also room for improvement. Uh, PIXIC is currently limited by mutually exclusive markers to capture the cells. And also we are just providing a snapshot of the interactions, but we might want to have something more continuous. Finally, um, from um, what I am aware of, there are currently um, several smaller companies trying to um, actually modify a droplet 10x style protocol to actually capture interactions. We'll see how far they'll get. Um, and then the other side of things is what happens when um, cells no longer interact? What happens when they've interacted and then separated? And that would be interesting to explore. But then again, we don't really have access to such clearly labeled cells to look at. Um, and finally, um, it would be really interesting to um, combine multiple modalities to actually study interactions. And there's some limited work done in this field um, that combines spatial transcriptomics with single cell RNA-seq. And um, finally, um, I would like to thank um, people who have contributed to this work. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Alex, for discussing some of the new approaches for determining physically interacting cells in, your, in single cell RNA sequencing data sets. But now I'd like to invite Thomas back for the question and answer session. So we're now can welcome questions for the speakers. If you have a question, please type it into the question box as shown in the image on the screen. Are you back, Thomas? Here we go. We've got a couple of questions already, so we'll start with those whilst we wait for some more to come in. So the first question is directed at Thomas from Frank Christian. How does targeted single cell RNA sequencing work? So basically targeted, targeted is, so, so the, the BD Absody is basically they have a, a panel and it's like a qPCR on a single cell basic. So they they know which which primer they have. They have and that is actually and they have a core set that they have different sets like immunology sets. And we added 50 genes of interest, and uh, and then you can run it. It's the same, roughly the same methods, and uh, the only thing is a bit cheaper, and you don't have to. Okay. Um, so the second question is for Alex from John Muller. Um, so he wasn't sure. Sorry if I missed it, but maybe could define what you mean by interaction. Right, so here when it comes to interaction, we are looking at cell-to-cell -cell interaction. Obviously, sometimes when it have, when we discuss line and receptor interactions can diffuse. And uh, what's important to note here is yes, some of the interactions um, outlined in the ligand receptor databases are overlapping with the physical cell-to-cell -cell interaction. So here we're talking about co-stimulatory adhesion molecules um, that basically they don't really occur if the two cells are not physically interacting. Um, so the idea here is that we um, ligand receptor database and the PeakSeq approaches, there is certain overlap in um, the interactions, but PeakSeq generally allows us to extend that to physical interactions and perhaps uncover novel interactions that haven't really been documented. So I've got another question for Alex from Yibo. Um I have a question for Alex. In the heat map in the ninth slide, how do you define the expression level of a topic, which I assume is a group of genes? Um, right, so um, that's the probability um, of a G of a topic for a cell. So basically all those things that I've discussed in, in terms of expression levels are probabilities for a certain topic um, in a cell. So that's how this is defined. To determine uh, specificity of a topic to a cell type, we perform a statistical test, uh, man with new test to determine if a topic is specific to a cell type, for example, in the T cell DCs, or whether it's something that's generally expressed across the board. Thanks, Alex. Um, so the next question, I think I'll direct to Thomas from Darja. Could single cell RNA sequencing be applied to bacterial cells and their interactions in the biofilms? Maybe both of you could answer that one. Yeah, I think the problem is the homopolymer, the, the homopolymer A tail, right? 
so you, you don't have it in bacteria. So technically, the, the, the 10x methods and all the, the smart seek plate based are basically not working. But there are other methods coming out where I don't, forgot the name, but basically, there's specific, there, there are some other methods coming out where you can tag it together. But the methods we present, like 10x, wouldn't work on bacteria due to the missing poly A tail on the transcripts. Yeah, I'm probably just going to echo what Thomas was saying on this one, that they have no experience with bacteria. I think that um, when it came to kind of weird application of um, um, sequencing, I think I was talking to someone who was complaining that they can't really quite apply um, single cell to plants. Uh, so I guess that there are kind of some challenges in terms of applications. And then also there's also the same problem with sometimes with site seek and what you can apply it to as well. Um, so loads of room for improvement um, and future work, basically. So we don't seem to have any more questions at the moment. If you do have any burning questions, please type them in. Um, I had a question for Thomas actually on the rheumatoid arthritis. So the different subsets of the macrophages, do they sort of try and classify them in the sort of M1, M2 phenotypes? Um, actually, I don't know. No, we never, I, I, as I said, I'm not an immunologist and how did that, if, if they looked into that, something to, to check actually if there's M1, M2. <laughs> but as far as I know, we, we didn't look at that and it would be interesting to see. But uh, no, I don't know. Good question. Oh, another question's just popped up for you, Thomas. How do you think the um, hyphen mass cytometry can advance the way we visualize macrophage interactions? I, I, the Hyperion, basically, a, a multi-channel cytometry. I think the interesting is what you have, you have basically the spatial resolution. So what you can do, you can have antibodies where you can label your different, mac uh, your different macrophages, can obviously then see which which marker genes are unique to specific subtype and then what you do you label that and the laser kind of goes over and captures the different antibodies and you have for the antibody of different layers you put together and what you can see actually is then which cells are close to your um, um, macrophage of interest to which fibroblasts are together so basically if two cells are spatially together and they have a specific phenotype due to the way we know it from the single cell, then you know that these interactions we actually propose are really happening. So the difficult part there is actually the integration of the, 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 the flow with the single cell, and that's mostly indirect because you can't do the same techniques from the same cell, or you wouldn't know as the same cell because you, you destroy one and the other. So over having the spatial resolution really allows us to understand where the cells really are, because as Alex said, it's, it's just most of your probability, something is expressed, something is expressed, but we, we, we work on the mRNA level, but we know these are proteins, right? So what's the lag, what's the communication? So the, the spatial methods like, like Hyperion really help and, and are very nice. And also you, you can apply these methods, Not we don't need fresh samples. You can look, go back to historical samples. I think it's, if, they were, if they're good, well stored, and then you can really have a look. So I think it's, 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 it's a great development in the field. Yeah, it answers the question. <laughs> no, that, that was great, Thomas. It sounds very exciting moving forward. And there's several methods so why no one is answered. So several people doing this. So if you read literature, cancer, COVID, uh, and, and people really integrate, and normally the tools lagging a little bit behind, but not a lot. And you see a lot of bioarchive papers, so and un, 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 peer reviewed paper that proposing tools how to integrate the data. Any last questions for Alex and Thomas? Okay, well, I'd just like to thank everyone for attending today and especially our speakers, Thomas and Alex. Um, we can continue with the conversation online through Twitter, so at BioChemSoc and at PP Publishing. Um, if you have any like topics that you'd like to suggest for future webinars, please suggest them. If you go into the Biochemical Society webpage, you can submit a proposal, um, so that'd be lovely. Um, all the webinars to date, there's been more than 35. You can still listen to them if you're interested. So, so if you go to the website or their YouTube channel, you can um, watch them again. Um, and like I said, what else was there? Oh, I just want to like promote the next webinar. 
So the next webinar will be for early career researchers and it's titled From PhD to CEO, CEO Becoming an, Innovation, an Innovation Leader. And that's on Tuesday the 2nd of November at three o'clock. Um, so I know like, you know, with COVID and everything, it's been quite challenging, but I would like to promote the Biochemical Society. I'm a member and they have fantastic courses, webinars and conferences. So please check out their website and become involved because it's a fantastic organisation to be involved in. And again, I'd just like to really thank Thomas and Alex for their fantastic talks today. And we look forward to seeing you again at another webinar. Okay. Goodbye.